Hello, and welcome to another episode of Let's Make It. And this week, we're running. Actually, I am running a little bit behind. I uh, didn't really get a chance to get much set up, but when I got home tonight, I worked on something, and I'm actually going to put together a segment. And uh, Bob's working on a secret project as well, right, Bob? Well, not so secret. <laughs> so um, we're working on a project. He's working on a project for next week. So we'll just bring it to you. Uh, next week but basically he wants to show a little bit more about some of the xp we've had some user questions or viewer questions and we want he wants to to cover that so didn't quite make it this week he's like me he's just a busy guy well yeah too busy sometimes yeah that's been me so i'm trying to get this switcher out and all and we decided to make some changes to it last minute so it's just been uh keep me busy because we're trying to get the uh the well we're not going to use kickstarter now we're going to use indiegogo but we're trying to get that campaign set up so we decided to go to bigger buttons and three color buttons versus two color buttons. So that was a last minute change, which meant some redesign of PC boards and stuff. So that's all in progress, but it just keep me busy. Yeah. And indeed it does. So, um, this week I have a, a fairly quick project is going to cover what we mentioned before about the web server. We're going to take it one step farther and, uh, we're actually going to control uh, an LED, an RGB LED, and a servo via the web interface. So it will show you what you can do to control things for projects over the web versus having physical buttons. So we'll do that in the, in the second segment. Um, we're going to start doing some things. We've had some requests to do some Raspberry Pi projects. Basically take what we've done on the Arduino and do them in Raspberry Pi. So we're going to start go back through some of the things we've done in the past and and do that on Raspberry Pi as well. And plus, I'm going to, I started playing with this uh, I've just got it booted, basically, and uh, I want to take it to the next step and uh, play with it a little bit more. But this is the um, BeagleBone, the BeagleBone Black. And what I've played with so far is pretty interesting. It's, it's a little bit faster than an Arduino. Actually, it's quite a bit faster than the Arduino. So um, I also played with a Duo, an Arduino Duo, a little bit this past week. Um, it seems limited, in, more limited in some ways, but faster and better in other ways. So it doesn't have any kind of EEPROM storage, which is something that, for what I, I was trying to use it for, I, I do need. Um, but its CPU is considerably faster than like a Mega. So I never realized that. I always consider it to be the lower end of that size board from Arduino, but it ends up being, it's a lot faster, a lot more memory. So have you ever played with one of those, Bob? Uh, no, I haven't, but it is, um, yeah, I couldn't remember the spec on it, right? Uh, yeah, it's running at 84 megahertz right? rather than the 16 that a regular... Right, and look uh, at the amount of RAM that it has compared uh, to the other ones. It says 512. The other ones are 256, so it has double of that. Um, uh, double the RAM. The The program space is four times the size, I think. The yeah. ARAM or PRAM? Um, uh, 96. 96. Right, three times. Okay. So it's considerably bigger as far as power goes. It's only missing the EEPROM. Uh, the other thing, it's 3.3 volts. So you get to kind of get used to doing things in 3.3 volts versus 5 volts. If you put 5 volts onto it, you're going you're gonna to mess it up. So, yeah, it's also 32-bit rather than 8-bit. Right, exactly. So it does four times the calculations in one clock cycle. Right. So that's, that's, I think that's probably the difference in speed that's the most noticeable is you know doing four times the amount of work. So, um, but the BeagleBone is a very similarly specced, so that's why I'm kind of interested to play with it a little bit. Um, actually, there's a lot more. There's a lot more stuff on this BeagleBone than what there is on on an Arduino. It's very interesting if you look at this. Actually, I can go to the. I don't know if you can see it in the overhead or not. There are service mount parts on both sides of this board, and a ton of them. Look how small they are. And then on this side too, the things is full of parts. So it's a very tight design. There's lots and lots of parts that are on it. So if it's very interesting, I always like playing with new stuff. So just finding the time to play with that kind of stuff. Yeah, sometimes it's a little tough to play. Yeah. But. <laughs> yep. Okay, or so. In this case, get demos. <laughs> yeah. The show. So we have Jim in the chat room tonight. He's asking some questions. Let me. Uh, he says my audio is muted. Is it better? Now, Jim, can you hear me now? You should be able to hear me. 
<laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> we'll keep going, assuming, because I, I see it going out to the stream, so I'm assuming that I'm okay, okay so I'll keep it going. Um, just want to remind you that we do this show live every Monday night uh, with all the problems, like you're seeing tonight, we've got a late start uh, because of some problems in the studio mostly. Um, also, my project was not working right. But uh, we're still having some technical issues around the studio, and it's, it always happens right before a show. So um, don't know what the issue is with that. We're still working through some of those changes. I'm almost regretting going to Windows, but I don't want to say that yet. So um, anyways, we're here every Monday night uh, at 9 p.m. We generally start at 9 p.m. We're a little late today, getting started a little bit late, but this will be a little bit shorter show than normal because we really only have one, one sketch to go through and show you um, some web control of physical things. So we're going to walk through here shortly. If uh, you're not watching us live, you can get us on demand on either on our website at tech TV, or you can go out to um, youtube.com slash techzentv, and you can get our stuff as well. We're also available in all the podcast locations, you know, uh, Dog Catcher, whatever you use, either Android or our Apple or PC, whatever, uh, iTunes, you name it, we're there. We also have a Roku app. If you have a Roku, you can download our app, and you can watch our stuff uh, right there on the Roku, right on the big screen uh, on your TV as well. All right, so we're going to take a real quick break here, and we'll be back. And when we come back, we're going to go through – I kind of gave you a little bit of a preview there a second ago. Um, it's basically the same board we used when we did the web, but we have some physical things we're going to control via the web interface when we come back. You work hard for your business. Your website should, too. No matter what industry you're in, Select your customizable, high-quality design with professionally written content and graphic elements created for your business. Make changes online whenever you like. Switch your background color, page layout, and text anytime. Add your pictures and logo. Upgrade your website with useful one-in-one -one web apps. And integrate social media. Upload your photo albums and embed videos. With one click, optimize your website for viewing on mobile devices. Choose your free domain or you can easily transfer an existing one. Thanks to one in ones SEO tools, customers can find you everywhere. one in one My Website, a professional website created by you. When you open up an Audible audiobook, it opens up your imagination. Enjoy a steamy romance while ironing the sheets. Discover an historic battle while battling the bulge at the gym. Visit audible.com slash free books now to try two books absolutely free. Get caught up in a whodunit during a do-it-yourself project. Listen anytime, anywhere with the Audible mobile app. When you're out for a walk, learn how to climb the corporate ladder. Or bring a little magic to your minivan with a fantasy novel. With over 100,000 titles, Audible is an amazing experience that you can now try absolutely free. And just like our books, there's no binding. Our Great Listen guarantee lets you exchange a title you don't like for another. No questions asked. Visit audible.com slash freebooks to download two books of your choice right now. Okay, we're back, and uh, before the break, we did a little teaser here. We're going to walk through it a little bit more, but we're going to talk about how you can control physical things from the web from a web interface using an Arduino. So we're going to hop over here, and as mentioned before, we basically have an Arduino Uno with an Ethernet shield. It's the exact same one we did when we did the card read, and also we did the other Ethernet web server show. And then you have this little breadboard here. You see the blue LED right here? And you have an RGB LED right here and a servo. And what I'm going to show you is how from a web page you can make these things do different things. So let's show you the web page real quick. All right, so here is the web interface that we have created this time. Still pretty simple, a single page. 
And you see I have uh, a web control can for control pins. And I'm going to turn off and on um, what is pin 13. And then I also have the ability to control a servo right here. I can say where I want the position, position to be. And then I can also turn on the RGB LED in different variations of colors based on from 0 to 55 uh, for red, green, or blue. So before I go into this, I want to walk through the code. It's actually a little bit more complicated because it's a little bit longer, but we'll walk through it. And it'll look fairly familiar from the web episode. So this is basically a number of different uh, shows kind of wrapped up into one because we have talked about servos. We talked about the RGB and the P pulse width modulation before, and we've covered pins in your know, turning LEDs on and off quite a bit, actually. So, and then we just covered the web server. So we're going to combine all that stuff into one. So we start at the top and I have to include uh, the SPI ethernet and web server just for the web server alone. The only other library I really need is the server.h because that's what we need to control the servo. And then we define our MAC address and our IP address right here, like we did in the previous show. And we want our web server to start on port 80 and no prefix. So basically it's going to have, be at the top level of the web server. And coming down, I create uh, a servo object called my servo. And then I'm going to define where I have the servo. Servo pin is equal to nine. And this particular servo um, is a little, di little different than the ones I used before. And I found out through experimenting this evening that it doesn't like going below 13. If you get below 13, it starts making this noise. And the follow down you go, it gets uh, lower and lower and lower. So, and then we have the maximum amount is 175. And that's what the old one was. I didn't see if I could go higher than 175 with this one. It's very possible that I could have. And then the current server position. Now you're going to see here, I should probably make this 13. Uh, so that starts at 13. And then we're going to come down and now we're going to define the red, green, and blue values. So, uh, that's weird. I don't know what that's doing there. I'll get rid of this. We are define our default colors of our red, green, and blue as 25. And what the C is, this is the current value. And the reason we have current servo and current red, green, or blue is I want to show you on the screen what the current value is. And I'm not doing that with the LED, and I'm going to show you why as we go going down here a little bit farther. So we have connected to pins 3, 5, and 6, the pins of red, green, and blue, right here, 3, 5, and 6. So that's basically our definitions uh, for this app. And now we're going to come down and define our default view, just the kind of we did uh, last or two weeks ago. And we create our header, and there's the Arduino web control title right here, and we're defining our font sizes. And then we are um, going to send out, when we get to the default page, we're going to send out success, where we're going to send out the 200 connect code. And then we're going to print this header right here. And then we're going to print out the actual web page. And this is where it gets a little bit longer. So at the very top, we're saying this is the title of the web page is web control. And then we're going to print out the H2 of control pins. And then we're going to do H3, which is pin 13. And then we create a form. And in this form, this is why there is no current state for the LED is first thing we do is we look at the state of the LED on pin two. And we say, okay, is it on or is it off? And if it is um, on, then we're going to print out to the, the web page a submit button that has the value of off for pin 13. If the pin is actually off, then it's going to come down to this else statement right here, and it's going to say, uh, here's a submit button with the value of on to pin 13. And then we close the form. So one of the things you're going to notice in this demonstration is we have multiple forms. And we do that uh, so that we don't change the value of what's being submitted for the other sections. We could have created one big form, but it's just a little bit more efficient to do it this way. So we're going to send out, we're going to close the form out right here. Then we're going to come down and we're going to print out server position. And this is where we're going to tell the servo how we want it to be um, or where we want it to be placed based on this value of the range of the servo. So we create another form right here, and it goes to the exact same uh, thing, slash form. And we have one text value, and it's basically the name of it is called servo. And we're going to print out in that field the current location of the servo. And that is done by us. So the current servo position I set to 12 or 17, I'm sorry, 17, 
at the top. And if you change that, I'm going to change that value so I know where your current value is so I can print it out to the web page so you know where you're at. And then we close out that form as well. And then we get into the RGB LEDs, and this is three input fields. We have one for each color. Again, we have our form, and then we define three text values, and here we go, input type is equal to text. And you see the value here, I'm putting C red, C green, and C blue. That's so I print to the, screen, the web page what the current values are for red, green, and blue. And you see the names of the fields are red, green, and then here is blue. And then there's another submit button right there. And we close that form, and then we close the page out. So we come down, here's our default command, which we talked about in the last episode. We can, If you want more details about um, how to do the web page in the web server, look at, listen to episode 49 where we cover that. I'm not going to go into to detail how to set up the web server on this episode. And then we come down, and here's our form command. And we're looking for, again, make sure it's a post. Here's our name and our values right here. We're going to read the post parameters up to 16 uh, for the name, up to 16 for the value. And you see right here, I create two uh, ver two string variables, one of them called name, one of them called value. And that's because I want to do some functions on these, on these later using the string class. So we basically are converting the character array of name into a string class of name, and the same thing with value. We're converting into a string class of value. So our first thing we do is we look for the pin 13. And with pin 13, if I receive the off, so the basically the submit button that's named off comes to me, I'm going to digitally write to pin 2. Uh, okay, that's right. I moved it from pin 13 to pin 2 because of um, pin 13 was having issues. So it's actually pin 2. I should probably rename this, and I'll do that for the final sketch to go to the, to the website. But it's actually pin 2. I'm going to turn it off. But if I don't get the off command, it has to be the on command, because that's the only other thing I have with pin 13. So then I'm going to go ahead and digitally write to pin 2 and turn it on so it's true. And then uh, we're going to look for servo. And right here I'm converting the text uh, to integer. So I take the value, the string, the character array of value, and I convert it to an integer into a variable called servo position or servo pause. And then I'm going to check and make sure that the value that was entered is... It, well, if I'm going to check, if it's less than the minimum servo, which is in my case is 17, I'm going to set it to equal to the minimum. And you're going to see that in the web page. I'm going to show you that when I put in a value that's out of range, it's going to fix itself. And the same thing goes with if it's out of position on the other direction. So if you put in a number that's bigger than the maximum position, it's going to take it to the maximum position, and you'll see that again. And then I write to the servo and tell it where I want it to go in servo position. And then I store where the current position is in current servo, so I can display it back on the web page when it when it prints back out again. And then I come down, and I check for a red, and I do the same thing. I take the number that comes in, uh, and that's in the value character array, and convert it to an integer. And if it's less than zero, that doesn't make any sense. So we're going to uh, make sure it's equal to zero. And the maximum value you can have output is 255. So if it's greater than 255, we're going to make it equal to 255. That's full brightness at 255. And then I'm going to do analog write to the red pin with that color number. Now you got to remember LEDs are controlled, brightness is controlled by pulse width modulation. So these are all on pulse width modulation capable pins. And when you write this number out, it sets the duty cycle for the pulse width modulation. And then I set the C red equal to the current color number because that's the last number that we got in from red. And I do this against the exact same thing again for, for green and for blue right here. And then at the very end, I say, go back to the top page. And if you don't send me anything to the form, I'm going to send you back to the default command uh, by default. And then in setup, there's a few uh, things down here. Um, we have to set our pin modes. And like I said, now I'm using pin 2 instead of 13. And I set the output. I set my red, green, and blue pins to output. I attach my servo to pin whatever servo pin is, which is actually 9 in this case. I start up my Ethernet, I start up the web server, and then I add my two default commands, or my default command and my form command. So if you look back at episode 39, we actually had an additional page here that we demonstrated, but we're just, in this case, I don't need an additional form. So it's just two items in that list. And then in the loop, all we do is process the connection. So we're doing all this in 223 lines of code. And that includes a very lengthy thing at the top that uh, gives you details about the code itself. So 
let's go ahead and I'm going to hop over to the oops the overhead and let me get back over to the web page and let's see if I can I mirror this or not um oops wrong one uh you can't see the computer so we're just gonna we're just gonna go right to the overhead so this is um I'm gonna hit on the on button on the on the web page and it's to turn the blue led on so here we go we're going to click i clicked and there it's on so if we come back over and we look at the web page right here it's it's off so the button says off right now because it's turned on so if we go and we click it to on to so now it says that it's off so we hit the button we'll turn it on and we come back over and we look we see that the led is off so i'm going to change the server position to let's say 200 which is above above the uh value so there the server moved from to 175 so if we go back over and we look you see right here our value is 175 and i actually put in 200 so our checking code that we had in there you see it puts it back to 175. same thing goes if i put two in here which is below 17 it's going to let your heart move make it 13. and actually you may be able to hear the um, servo still fighting itself. So let's go to 14. Maybe 13 wasn't wasn't far enough. I don't. Oh, I'm still doing it. Let's make it 15. Um, it's still fighting. I can feel it. I actually have my hand on it right now. So let's see, 16. Still doing it. I thought it was 17. Was where I. Yeah, I know it's still doing a little bit, but it's better. Try 30 once and see what happens. It definitely is not making noise now. All right, so we're back. It's working. I don't know what, what happened there. Um, but if we are, let's go back and look at it. I'm going to do the RGBs now. So right now they're for tw 25, 25, and 25. When I hit submit, you see the LED that comes on. But if I want it to be like red, I can make the red... For example, 255, press enter, there's red. Um, unfortunately, with this LED, I don't know. You, right now, there's no red. And let me turn off the blue. The green seems to be very weak to me. So there's green. So there's full green, 255. If I turn on full red, it just walks over the green. You can't even tell what's even there. So let me turn off the green. I couldn't see any difference. Now, if I turn the blue on, I can tend I can tend to see the difference. Oh no, not with that, but I can't. It's like red on this thing is super bright. Let me turn off the red. So there's blue, and only blue. There's blue and green. So if you watch uh, on the web page, I basically I'm just changing these values. So if I make if I turn them all on full brightness. And we go look at it. You see, red is is very very bright. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the green and the blue. And I couldn't tell any difference. You can't even tell the red, and the green, and the blue are there because the red's so bright. So I don't know. I don't know why that is. I haven't been over. I haven't looked at the uh, specs on this particular. LED because there's green, so we can see a little bit of red in there. Red's down to 30 now, and there's red at 50. There's red at 90. So you can see red starts taking over. Green's at full brightness, and red's starting to take over already at 90. If we can turn on the blue. So yeah, it's don't know why. Um, there's every LED RGB LED has different specs to it, and this must be one that's very uh, red red uh, facing all right so again here's the uh, servo and see that's at, that's at the high of 175 and let's go down to uh, 17 and see if it makes the noise it did before is it still doing it no it's not it's not kicking like it was before so I think 17 was the number where I I thought it was. It's still not doing it. It's still very quiet.
it's starting to do it right there so it's just vibrating a little bit but you can see from a simple web interface you can control all kinds of things if you could add a relay to the leds and control all kinds of things as in addition to getting status of things so we kind of showed last week about uh, outputting things or data from like a sensor but here if you look at the code i'm actually outputting this right here this on and off you see how it changes based on the state of another pin so if we come in here and we look down here in the source code right here i'm looking at the pin state and i'm putting out the different value depending on the state of the pin so you can do all this stuff via a web interface and be a Think of a web controller for your garage door. You look at the web interface and you say, hey, the garage door is still open. You click the button and it closes your garage door. So that's the kind of type of thing you can control uh, using a web interface like this. So, and tonight obviously was a very rough night technology-wise for us. So, <laughs> uh, and we only have one thing. So, Bob, Bob, that's something. Do you want to walk through it real quick, Bob, and explain what you're going to do next week? Just give him a tease. How's that? Well, yeah, I got the tease. Uh, let me switch cameras. This is the this is the uh, the tease for next week, and what I've got is a Arduino with a XB radio uh, connected to an LCD screen, and then I have this uh, 25 uh, key keypad, and if I press a key, I get something on the screen, and ultimately what I'm going to this what I'm going to do is use the radio to transmit data that um, that is connected to uh, another Arduino that is running a um, and I actually believe it or not I had I still had the breadboard put together uh, when we did that 14 segment multiplexing episode uh, I think it was somewhere around episode 30. He has been a while. 20, 28, 30, some, somewhere around in there. I still have that display on the breadboard. Um, I never took it apart, and I'm going to use that. And uh, this is actually based on a, a number of viewers who have questioned um, how do you transmit data back and forth and have a remote display. So I've probably got five or six people that have asked me variations on that question, and uh, this is going to answer, I hope, all of them. So, um, but I've uh, I've got some smaller di uh, videos that I'll show next week. Um, that uh, you know, essentially, essentially one of them is nothing more than blink over the radio, uh, the standard you know hello world kind of programming for a microcontroller so and that's all it does is it just blinks the led on the other on the other display so so, so i've actually got a couple videos and several variations of the code and we'll kind of step through it but uh this will be a episode where we put the pieces together of different episodes that we've had over the last six months so which the zigbee the xbs you have do they have the antenna on top or are they the ones that are flat on top uh, they're the small, uh, they're actually small antennas, uh, and I don't know if you can, you can see it. It's actually right here. If you can, uh, let me move the, you see the, yeah, so small you have antenna. a little wire on top of it, right? Little wire antenna. Yes, yeah, so you had the one that had a little square on top of it, so they didn't, I don't know how far they went. I was kind of curious how far yours would go apart before they stopped working. According to the spec, these are supposed to be reliable at, at full speed uh, up to 30 meters indoors. That's it? 30 meters? I thought 30 it was meters long. indoors in a building. Okay. Uh, outdoors, it's 100 meters. Okay. That's, that's what the spec says. I haven't actually tried it because the, the other radio, well, actually, I don't even have it connected. They're... They're a foot apart right now on my desk. Right. I mean, I got the ones that had the smaller antennas because I was going to be testing them, um, you know, right next to each other. So it didn't make, I didn't really care about distance. But I've had that question before about how far away do they work. Right. So, And and I do have uh, – and uh, I am planning on doing the same uh, – as I'm transmitting data with an Arduino, I've got my Pi out, and I'll be showing how to – 
uh, send the data with a PI as well, or at least have the code ready to, ready to show and uh, show how we connect it up. Whether we do it live with uh, both units, we'll see if I can get that together for next week. Okay. So you're going to use the XPs for that too? Yep. Okay. So... Um, this we you know I talked about this already this week. I ordered some of these other 2.4 gigahertz things, and here I got one right here. Let me go. It's really small, but it's 2.4 gigahertz. When I first got it, I thought it was either gonna be Bluetooth or some kind of Wi-Fi, but it's not. It's its own protocol thing. So um, I'm going to experiment with this sometime in the next couple weeks as well. So we can curious about distance on these two you can see the antenna is actually on the board so it's probably not very far um i've got a set of these coming as well yeah so we'll and see this it. is good yeah and one of the viewers uh i think you were copied on the he, he's got sensors using these radios for his garage and yeah actually yeah, i didn't know this was the one it was the one he was using yeah this is the one he was using okay the, the one he's using so we're going to tackle that problem as well. Yeah, that'd be a that'd be a good uh, experiment. So, yeah, I'm kind of curious how they work through walls and stuff too. That's kind of why I was asking about the the, the XP stuff because I got the ones that don't have the antennas on it, and I thought the ones with the antennas on it would were a little farther than that. But all right. Well, my you've got the one you've got the ones with the antenna on the board, correct? Yes, a little square solder on antenna. All right, I've got ones coming that have a small uh, screw in uh, screw in antenna. Right, right. Yeah, it's, that's the ones I probably should have gotten because, I, well, I figured if I was sitting here at a table doing it, I wouldn't have to go very far. But then I'd like to experiment with things a little bit farther away. So I was kind of curious how far they would, how far they worked. Well, the ones with the radio on the board, I like that because you could uh, you could make things that are very small and easy to hide and turn things on and off. And right, that's the problem with the, I, the I XPs are, of are kind of big. For those, yeah, the XPs are kind of big. To yeah, the XP is kind of big, and its spacing is not two point five four either. It's two. Mm, okay. So you can't just plug it into yes. a, reg a regular um, yes, breadboard. That's right. That's right. You can't. That's why I, I had a board design put together and and made, but I don't think I ever tested it because I didn't want to have to, you know, custom make something every time I want just to play with. Right. Yeah, that is one thing about the XB that's uh, a little a little disappointing. Yeah, there's other um, Zigbee type chips out there. XB is just the most popular one because it's you know common form factor and they make other things that fit in that same form factor as well right so you can pretty much pull one out and put another one in if you have a generic connection to it so you're you're running them in serial communication mode right like what goes in one comes out the other yes that's right so yeah this is and i'm running it back and forth and uh in in one example uh, we will talk about uh yeah, the, the buffers and the radios and how to prevent data collisions and not overload the buffers uh, and and write the code to be smart and be aware of the buffers. Right. So, yeah, the, the XPs have the ability to go into another mode, which I like to experiment with a little bit more, where you can individually address them. Because my understanding is if they're in this serial mode, they do not work in a mesh anymore. Yeah, the, the, the two that, these two that I've got, they, they only talk to each other right now. Right. But if you take them out of that mode, they can work in a mesh mode as well. But, that's right. And you can also uh, and have have one being the controller and then you can have routers and then you can have right points. Yeah. And, and and bounce singles signals back and forth between the whole. Yeah, it was just very complicated. I mean, I tried experimenting with that a little bit and just getting the work through serial wasn't the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Um, and I made sure that I I grabbed the. Uh, uh, you know, created files for the setup of the of the radios because I that was probably the most difficult part is just getting the radios working. Right, which is kind of saddening in a way because it'd be nice to stick them in and let the Arduino do the configuration, but it doesn't work like that. No, it does. Sadly, it does, it isn't. Right. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to stick one in and say, okay, you know, here's what you are. You go do your work, and you don't have to go through the extra step. You just plop it in. Now you got to program everything, every one of those things. To use them 
Right. Yeah, that was the frustrating part that I had whenever I was playing with them too. But mine still, if I plug them in, they just work because I, they're still synced together and everything. So it's, I get them out occasionally just to play with different things. But I like to go ahead and change that mode and over now to um, to be, try the routing in the in the controller format. The problem is I do so much on a Mac and it does they don't have any software for the Mac. It only runs on the PC. So uh, there is a programmer out now. The uh, um, uh, what is it called? The um, AC. I forgot. I forgot the whole name. There is a Mac. Uh, when you did episode twelve, mm -hmm. where you set up the episode, um, it was version five, and it was only available for Windows. I found when I was programming mine last week, there is a version six and a Mac. And there is a Mac. Uh, oh, I'll have to go try that out. Because that was, now. I was doing it in a VM. Sometimes it, I think that made my my difficulties a little bit worse because like, sometimes I wouldn't see it in the serial communication. So I think yes. that was part of it. So you yeah, have to go dig that up and, and play with it. That'd be cool. Cool to play with. Yeah, the, the only thing about the Mac version that I didn't like that I actually didn't get working on the Windows version is you're supposed to be able to test the range of radios once you have them set up. And I didn't get that working on mine. Uh, and once I had it working, range, I was happy they were working and I was trying to get the demo done. So I skipped that part. All right. Well, that's something we look forward to for next week then. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, you know, we've been doing this for 44 minutes with all kinds of technical issues before and during. So I just think we need to, like, get it over with. Call it, call it a night. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. So hopefully next week i got more time ahead of time. I mean, I basically did that sketch within the last three hours and worked fine on the test bench. And when I got it in here, it's like it's not working again. And I finally figured out that I was having a problem with the MAC address being duplicated on another switch. And yeah, it was just... Not to mention all the broadcast problems that's been going on. So, well, I've got I'll have quite a few sketches and quite a few files for next week, but uh, we we won't go through them in uh, great detail because a lot of it is topics we've covered in the past. Okay, sounds good. So, anything on the chat room? I've been chatting a little. Yeah, I see. I see that. That's good. All right. All so. right. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> we'll call it a night before something call else tonight. before something else blows up on us. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll see you all everybody next week. Good night. For show notes for this show, contacts and more, go to the techzen.tv website where you can get show notes for all of our shows. We love to hear from our viewers and listeners. We have an email, a Twitter, and a phone number where you can contact us for each show. For details, visit the techzen.tv website and get the show details. You can also make a video and upload it somewhere like YouTube or Vimeo and then just send us a link. You never know, you may see your video in a future show. You can get all of our shows delivered automatically to your favorite device by going to your favorite podcast website like iTunes and subscribing. Each of our shows also has a YouTube channel you can subscribe to to get regular updates. Our shows are also available on most internet radio networks like Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. You can also watch and listen to our shows on Xbox, TiVo, and Roku. You can even find us on your Zoom.